Okay, so we're going to go ahead and begin uh, this evening. Uh, we're going to be covering chapter three. We're going to be talking about uh, contracts that are going to be used in real estate. Uh, so we're going to be going through a lot of material this evening, uh, but we will be discussing contracts that are actually being used within the real estate field. Uh, so with that being said, we're going to start off with looking at our learning objectives uh, this evening. Uh, where we're going to first start off with is we're going to be talking about uh, distinguishing between uh, express and implied, uh, as well as bilateral and unilateral, uh, as well as executed and executory contract. It's going to be our first learning objective. Then we will explain the difference in valid, void, voidable, and unenforceable contracts. We'll also then identify the essential elements of a valid contract and explain the difference between an assignment and an ovation. Uh, we are also further then going to end up in the same situation. Uh, we're going to be giving examples of what constitutes a breach of contract. Uh, we're also going to list reasons for a termination of the contract and describe the types of contracts that are used in the real estate business and the, to describe the different types of listings and how they may be terminated. Further, we're going to identify the information needed for a listing agreement. Uh, we're gonna compare a listing agreement and a buyer agency agreement. We'll further define uh, the types of leasehold estates and summarize the requirements and general conditions of a valid lease and how it may be discharged. And our last two objectives is going to describe the different leases and when they are used and discuss the potential use of an option and a land contract. Again, these are some of the objectives that we will be covering this evening. Uh, again, there are a lot of them. We're gonna be covering a lot this evening, so uh, please bear with me as we get through the content tonight, uh, but there's going to be a lot of information that we will be covering. So uh, be ready to get engaged uh, because I will be kind of calling on a lot of different people tonight. So be ready and be alert tonight. All right. <clears throat> so let's start with contract law. Now, of course, the most important and biggest thing about this is with contract law is contract law breaks down everything. The whole summary of contract law is based upon two things, okay? Two things here. Uh, a contract is a legally enforceable agreement, the key word there, agreement, to either do something or not do something, okay? Now, wouldn't it be nice that everything was that simple, okay? That we just go over and we say to do or not to do. However, what you need to know is you're gonna to have to know these terms, okay? The word do actually means performance, okay? So when you're taking your test, they're going to ask for the word performance. While not to do is gonna be forbearance, okay? So if you want somebody to not do something, you're gonna ask them to forbear their action. Now, in this particular situation, we also need to understand that there is going to be a breakdown in regards to the different terminology, the different way of things being done and all. But again, ultimately the contract law process is focused more upon this theory of doing and not doing something, okay? So you have to be able to know these two differences because they both are ultimately giving two things. It is to do and not do, to perform or to forbear. Okay, so no matter what we're talking about, when we're talking about contracts tonight, we're talking about doing or not doing. And I'm hint, uh, harping on this because it is imperative that you understand these differences, okay? So we know that a contract ends up, it's to do or not to do. But in this situation, we also wanna understand that there's different ways in how a contract can be created, okay? so. You have two types of a way or methods that contracts are created. You have expressed and you have implied. Express, as you see, the definition says that the parties state the terms and show their intentions in words, either oral or in writing. 
Okay. While implied is going to be agreements of parties that is demonstrated by their actions or conduct. So in this situation, Miss Linda, I come up to you and I say to you, Miss Linda, um, I would like for you to go over and um, come work for me, and I'm going to pay you fifty dollars an hour. Okay. I have expressed the terms by my words. Now they're not in writing, it's oral. And so it is going to be an express contract. I orally offered something to you. And if you say, I accept your offer, you orally agree to my offer, therefore it is an express contract. If I put it in writing and I submit it to Miss Linda and Miss Linda comes back and signs it, it's still gonna be an express contract because it's in writing, okay? But either or, oral or written, it is still going to be an express contract. Now, if however, I go in and I say something one day, I'm sitting down with Miss Linda at lunch and I say, man, wouldn't it be nice if I could have me um, an, an office manager to come in and, and run my office for me? Wouldn't it be nice, okay? And that's all I say, that's all I end up saying. And Miss Linda decides that she is going to go over and Miss Linda is going to say, you know what? I'm gonna go up without talking to Justin and I'm just gonna come up and I'm gonna start working in his office. So she comes up, she starts working, she starts acting as the office manager and ends up, I, because she's working, just start paying her, okay? There's no verbal written agreement. Her actions created me this implied contract, okay? Through her actions, by coming to the work and by me paying her, my actions of paying her, we now have created an implied contract versus an express contract, we have an implied contract, okay? So in this situation is, these are your two methods. So understand this can also, for example, these can also be the same thing. Remember these are, that one I just gave you, that hypothetical is a doing contract. She comes in, she works, I pay her, it's doing, okay? A contract, that is going to be a forbearance is that I go over and I say to Miss Linda, Miss Linda, I would like for you to go over, if you wouldn't mind, I would like for you to go over and have your dog start barking. I want to stop barking, it's driving me crazy, stop barking. So Miss Linda goes over and Miss Linda, you know, she says, well, I will be willing to uh, have my dog stop barking if you end up giving me some money, okay? We come to an agreement, I give Miss Linda some cash, she gets her dog to start barking, it's a win-win situation for everybody, okay? That's a forbearance. She legally has a right to have her dog barking and all on her property. It's her property, her dog barks, that's what they do. But I can ask her to forbear that act by giving her some type of benefit. And that in this situation would be a cash offer, okay, or cash money. So again, this breaks down the expressed and the implied. Now also you'll see under expressed is it says, most real estate contracts are gonna be expressed contracts. They have been committed to writing, okay? And they're under the statute of frauds that certain types of contracts must be in writing, very key, to be enforceable in a court of law, okay? So one thing, there's two big things we wanna focus on here. Most real estate contracts are going to be expressed. And the reason they're going to be expressed is because of the statute of frauds. So here's your note that you get to take. The statute of frauds states that any real estate transaction must be in writing unless, there's only one exception, unless it's for a lease that's one year or less. Okay? So any selling of real estate, any rental of real estate that's one year or more has to be in writing. No ifs and buts. Okay, but if it's for a lease for one year or less, it does not have to be in writing. Okay, so the statute of frauds, of course, is going to create certain types of contracts that must be in writing for them to be enforceable. If I want to go purchase a property 
and my contract is oral. I say to Mr. Grossman, Mr. Grossman, I want to purchase your property from you. And Mr. Grossman tells me that, um, you know, all right, Mr. Nobles, I'll sell you my property. I say, all right, perfect. So I give him some money. He gives me title to his land. Is that a valid contract, Garrett? Yes, sir. That is, are you certain about that, Mr. Garrett? Uh, can you say it again? It's kind yes. of staticky. All right. Can you hear me now? Does that sound a little better? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So my question is in this situation is Mr. Grossman, I go up to Mr. Grossman and I tell Mr. Grossman that I will buy his property from him, all oral, not writing. And I say, I'll give you a hundred thousand. Mr. Grossman says, sounds good. Here's the uh, the title to my property. I gave him 100000 Is that a valid contract pursuant to the statutes of frauds? Uh, no, sir. Why do you say that? Uh, because it's not in writing, so it doesn't really mean anything to court. Exactly, sir. Exactly. So it has to, if it's selling a property, it has to be in writing. If it's not in writing, it's not going to be a valid contract. Okay? So give you a real life situation for all of you to hear. I had a client that I ended up, he was selling his property. We ended up, we put the property on the market. And while we put the property on the market, his son ended up was at home. And while his son was at home, guess what ended up happening? His son went over and a lady had came in, wanted to see the property. And the lady goes over and looks at it and says, I will give your dad $150,000 for your property. The son goes over and the son ends up tells his dad and his dad's like, yeah, I would entertain that offer. Well, in that particular situation, just because he says he'll entertain the offer does not create a contract. Okay. You can say things, but ultimately under the statute of frauds, the statute of fraud says that there has to be a contract that is in writing, okay? And I'm emphasizing a lot in this situation because of the fact is the statute of frauds must end up, it has to be in writing or otherwise it is not classified as a valid contract and thus will not be enforced by a court of law, okay? So now we're gonna jump into this. <laughs> I can see everybody here is kind of getting tired already because of the wonderful stuff of contracts, okay? Contracts can be boring, but also they can be very interesting as well. So before we jump into all of this that's on the slide here, a lot of this is very confusing and it's gonna be confusing, okay? Before we do any of that, I want you to write on your sheet of paper, bilateral, and on the next line, I want you to put unilateral. Okay, so I want you to put those on your notes. While you are doing that, I want you to, as you're writing, I want you to think about this. What is the first two letters of bilateral, Miss Linda? Bi. Bi. What does bi mean? Okay. No. B-I. What's that mean? Bye. What's he doing? Two. Means two. Two. Oh. By means two. two. Okay. So by means two. So I want you to end up putting bilateral equals the number two. Miss Nobles, question for you. You ever played this game called Uno? Yeah. So what's the next word? Unilateral. So uni is just a nicer word for Uno. So how many is that? One. Okay, so uno means one. Bi means two. So next to unilateral, let's just put unilateral equals one. Now that you got your numbers wrote, I want you to write next to the two and the one. I want you, after those numbers, I want you to put the word party. So, Mr. Grossman, bilateral, how many parties are involved in a contract? Two, Miss Linda, how many parties are involved in a unilateral contract? One, okay. So in that situation, now that I've explained that to you and put it in basic terms, 
Miss Linda, real quick, an independent contractor agreement ha requires how many parties? Two people, right? Mr. Grossman, how many people are required in a lease agreement? Two. Uh, Mr. Keith, how many people are in an option to terminate? Uh, you're coming up a little fuzzy on my end. Could you repeat that? Yes, sir. How about now? Oh, you're good. You're good. You got it? All right. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So in this situation, my question is, how many parties are in a unilateral contract? One. One. I'm going to ask you one more. How many in an option to terminate or an option to purchase? How many parties? One. One. Excellent job. Uh, Mr. Garrett come to you now. How many people in a enlisting agreement, how many is going to be in an exclusive right to sell? Two. Two. And what about an open listing? One. Very good. If you see here, I'm basically re being repetitive in these situations. So in this situation, you kind of see you need to know how many parties are going to be involved in each one of these types of leases. Okay. But if you notice here, this is a little sidebar note, okay? And those of you, if I get staticky while I'm on this, I've got a new headset. So if it gets staticky, y'all jump in and let me know. Um, but the question is here in this situation is, is that if we end up, we have this breakdown here of these listings. The question is, do you ever see at any point, Miss Linda, do you ever see three or four people? The maximum number to these contracts are how many? Two, so what's the minimum? One, so there's never three. So if there can only be one or two people, do you think a broker will ever be included in these contracts most of the time if it's dealing with a contract for sale? No, okay. So in that situation is, there will be points that the broker is gonna be involved, but if it's actually a sale of the contract, the broker is not always going to be involved in the contract because there can only be two parties. Okay. And we'll talk about that. Again, two more. Mr. Grossman, how many people are involved in the buyer tenant representation? Two. How about the purchase agreement, Mr. Grossman? There you go. We have two. Okay. So again, you need to know those differences. We will talk about these forms in a little while. I'm not going to jump into them. I could sit here and teach you about the forms all night long. And if I do that, I guarantee you we'll be here till at least 10 or 11 o'clock this evening. And I promise you, you do not want me to be teaching until 10 or 11 o'clock. So we're going to hit only the topics. We will cover these forms when we get into contract forms and addendum. Now, the next thing that we're gonna be talking about is we're gonna be talking about executory and execute it, okay? An executory contract is going to be an enforceable contract that is in the process of being fulfilled or going to be performed. Okay, so in an executory, it's basically the keyword is in process. Okay, so it is a valid contract. So if Mr. Garrett and myself, we are, I'm buying Mr. Garrett's property, I sign a contract with Mr. Garrett. In that particular situation is, it is considered an executory contract because it is an enforceable contract. It is in the process, but it has not been totally fulfilled, okay? A executed contract is that all promises in the contract have been made. So that means once a contract is fully signed, closed, and funded, it is now classified as an executed contract. Now, here's where the fun gets because the the government, you know, the testing people love to play with y'all when you're taking your test, okay? So here's the fun part. When you sign a contract, so Mr. Garrett, I'm gonna come back to you for a minute. Mr. Garrett, me and you sign a contract, sir. I've signed and you've signed, what is that contract called? The contract has been what? Uh, executed. Exactly. But has it really been ex executed? Uh, no, sir. That's a trick question, ain't it? So in that particular situation is, is yes, you are correct, 100%. The contract has been executed, 
But in reality, it's only been executed from the signing portion, not from the completion portion, okay? So when you're completing or you're taking your test, this is one of those areas that they'll trick you with. They will say the contract has been executed at the point of signature. Well, you gotta read the part before it to see what they're talking about in regards to the terminology of executed, okay? So I'm gonna tell you, it can get a little, a little unclear here in some situations, okay? So I just wanna give you all, all a fair warning that that can occur, but you need to keep this entire slide in your background so that you have an understanding of what's going on, okay? Now that we've got through that, now we're getting into the good stuff, all right? We're getting into the good, good stuff here. So we're gonna talk about basically the essentials or the essential elements of a valid contract. Again, we're going to of course have the very first initial step of a contract is the offer and acceptance, okay? So when I go over and Mr. Eugene, I go over and I say to him, I want to buy your house, that is my offer, okay? Mr. Eugene says, I will accept your offer. Now we have our offer and acceptance and we can check that one off, okay? However, we still have to have all of these other elements that are still here. So we have to have consideration. There has to be something that is going to be for consideration. There has to be something of value that's being transferred. Now here's where the tricky part comes into, okay? When we're talking about consideration, it has to be something of value. So. In this particular situation, Mr. Keith, I'm gonna ask you a question, sir. So let's kind of change this up a little bit. So Mr. Keith, he has a very sweet mother, very, very sweet lady, and he goes over and he tells his mom because his mom wants him to end up to get her property when she is to pass away. So she says to you, Mr. Keith, that son, I want to sell you my property but I need some form of consideration from you. And you say, mom, I have no money. I just have my love and affection to give to you. My question to you, Mr. Keith, is that enough to, to meet the requirements of consideration? Yes or no on that one? I would say no on that. Say no, okay. Yeah. All right. Miss Linda agrees with you in here. She's saying the same thing. Thank you, Miss Linda. <laughs> so in the situation, she, she says she's not sure if she's right or not, but she's going to go with it. <laughs> okay. So, but the thing is, if unfortunately it is, it is enough. Okay. Okay. You can actually tell your mom that with my love and affection, that is my consideration because here's the thing, Keith and Linda as well. The key thing that comes into this is value, like they always say, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Okay. Same situation here. Your her, his mom loves her son, just like he loves his mom. So in exchange in that situation, it is a value, uh, it is an asset to his mother. Therefore, the word consideration does not always have to be money. It's something that the party, the other person, has to be willing to accept, okay? Miss Linda, you're, you're confused here. What do you think, Miss Linda? But that's the word of mouth, and number two is- It'll be in writing. It's gonna be in writing for love and affection. So it will be in writing. Yes, yeah, so Keith would write, I'm buying my mother's house for blah, with love and affection. You have to get that paper notarized. Nope. So remember, only two parties. Okay. So, for instance, if you have other siblings and it's a disgruntled family, and they come up later and say, "This isn't my mother's signature," then what do you? Do? Well, of course, you you can always have challenges in court and everything, but we're not getting into that detail, not yet. Okay. okay. We just want to kind of keep it basic because we don't want to challenge too much because a lot of people are still learning. So we don't want to scare them off. But the key thing is, is yes, love and affection does count as consideration. Now here's where they're going to come into. This is what they're going to get you on the test. They're going to tell you that the only thing that consideration can be is 
money. And that's not the truth. Consideration can be anything. Consideration can be love and affection. Consideration can end up being uh, not just love and affection. It can end up, Keith may have a boat that his mother's always wanted. He can give his mother his boat, maybe his truck. He can give assets to his mother. But the value, of course, in anything is what? It goes back to the offer and acceptance. If the parties agree, the, if there is an offer and acceptance, guess what? That offer and acceptance is all that matters. The offer and acceptance is going to state the consideration. Okay? So they're going to get you there. They're going to say, is love and affection enough? Yes, it is. Is love and or is consideration, is it only money? No. Is your earnest money consideration? No. Earnest money is never, never, you can actually now put that on your paper, never consideration. Earnest money is never consideration. Okay? It is just a serious intent. Now, consent here. Consent is in this situation, okay? Consent is where that individual has to have the knowledge to be able to consent. So in a situation, say that, for example, that Mr. Grossman, in this particular situation, Mr. Grossman, he is over here, and he ends up, he has been declared mentally incompetent by the court of law. Okay, well, if he is declared mentally incompetent, Miss Linda, got a question for you. Do you think that if he is mentally incompetent, do you think that Mr. Grossman is able to contract with another party? What do you think? Okay, Miss Linda says yes. All right, Mr. Keith, here's your, here's your chance. Do you agree or disagree with Miss Linda? I'm sorry, Miss Linda, but I'm gonna have to disagree on that. Ah, one. see, he disagrees with you, Miss Linda, and he's correct, okay? He is correct in that situation because of the fact is, he ends up, he cannot, Mr. Grossman is not mentally stable. So he cannot contract with somebody because he does not even know what he's doing. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, another thing is we have to have legal purpose. What exactly is our purpose? That's very key here. We have to make certain that we have a legal pur purpose. So we're going to use this in a situation. I always like to use this example every semester is Mr. Grossman. We're going to pick on him again. He's now, he's now mentally stable again, okay? But he wants to buy Miss Linda's property for the sole purpose to grow marijuana on it here in Texas. I have to add that in here now. Here in Texas. He wants to buy Miss Linda's property here in Texas to grow marijuana, okay? Mr. Garrett, is Mr. Grossman's purpose to purchase the property, a legal purpose, and if so, how? No, sir. Exactly. It is not a legal purpose because in Texas, marijuana is illegal. Because it's illegal, it does not have a legal purpose, therefore the contract is not valid. Okay? Again, we also have to have, again, legal competent parties. This kind of goes back up with consent. We're not going to go back through that. Those two kind of go hand in hand. And then, of course, you got to make certain that any real estate contract must be in writing and signed by the parties pursuant to statute of fraud. Now, here's the best part of all. For a contract to be valid, keyword here, valid, what ends up happening is all of these have to be checked off. If one of them is not checked off, this entire contract is not valid, and because it's not valid, it cannot be enforced, okay? So, jumping, jumping on into the next part, we're going to talk about the validity of contracts, all right? First off, the most important one in regards to the validity of contracts is that, like we said, it has all legal elements and therefore would be fully enforceable, okay? So in this particular situation, it has all of the elements 
And since it does have all of the elements, it is in this particular situation going to be fully enforceable, okay? Now, a void contract is gonna be one that lacks just one or all of the elements and has no legal force or effect, okay? So if it is missing just one element, like I said, Mr. Grossman is mentally incompetent. Well, if he is mentally incompetent, Mr. Grossman does not know or cannot transact. And since he cannot transact, his contracts would be void on their face, okay, is what we say. They're voided on their face. Now, the next one is voidable. And this one is always my favorite. I love picking with this one, okay? Avoidable contracts will have all the elements. All of them are checked. However, it may be rescinded or disaffirmed by the party that is not of mental capacity, okay? And what we mean here is <clears throat> Mr. Grossman, I'm gonna pick on him again. Actually, no, I'm gonna pick on Mr. Garrett right now. Mr. Garrett, he is uh, 16 years of age. And Mr. Garrett goes over and he says, uh, he tells Mr. Grossman, he says, Mr. Grossman, he says, I want to purchase your house from you. Mr. Grossman says, sure, certainly you look like you're at least 18 years of age. I'm not going to verify anything. I'm going to go ahead and trust you. So they go ahead, go through the whole process. Mr. Garrett is legally competent. He's just 16 years of age. He goes through, all the stuff is there. Mr. Grossman ends up, sells the property to Mr. Garrett. Mr. Garrett gets in the property, gets in there, lives there for a little bit, makes some destruction to the property and says, oh, I don't want this property anymore. I wanna rescind my contract. My question, Mr. Garrett, is can you rescind your contract? Uh, no, since I'm already moved in. Mr. Keith, do you agree or disagree? Uh, I disagree on that. Mr. Keith's on a road tonight. He is correct. Mr. Keith is correct in the situation is yes, he can end up, he can rescind the contract even if he's moved in because the fact is Mr. Garrett is a minor. And because he's a minor, he is not of age to contract. But if you go back here for a minute, let's go back a slide. Do you see anywhere up on this slide that it says, that you must be of age or have a certain age. No, age is not mentioned. So therefore, the only thing that could happen that Mr. Garrett is going to argue is that he was not legally competent. The word legally there is your red flag because what does the law say? When does a person become an adult? At what age? 18 actually by contract law. I know criminal law is, is 17, but contract law is at age 18. So if Mr. Garrett is 16, he may be, say he was 17, and criminally he could be an adult, but in contract law it says 18. So even though he's competent, he's not classified as legally competent. Does that make sense, Mr. Garrett? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay, and I'm glad y'all are making these mistakes. This is how you learn, okay? Don't feel bad, where that's the process, that's how this all works. Now, the next thing we're gonna talk about is unenforceable. Unenforceable is where you're gonna have all legal elements and is enforceable only between the parties, okay? So in this situation, you have all the legal uh, elements and it is enforceable. However, it technically can't be enforced. So what exactly do I mean by that? Well, here we go. Mr. Eugene uh, has a contract with Ms. Nobles and he ends up, he tells Ms. Nobles, I wanna end up, I uh, wanna go over and I want to purchase your property. I have the money, I'm of age, I've got all the stuff, all the elements are met, I'm good to go for it. I'm ready to buy it. But here's the thing, Ms. Nobles, okay? is that Mr. Eugene and you, while y'all are waiting for the contract to go through, Mr. Eugene's house that you're buying ends up, falls into a sinkhole. And because your house falls into a sinkhole, 
can you end up selling or can a contract be done if the house is no longer there? No. So because of that, all legal elements were present and it is enforceable, except the problem is that the house has just disappeared. And if it's disappeared, we cannot legally enforce you to do something. Okay, that's why it's unenforceable. So again, you're gonna be needing to know all four of these because all four of these are gonna be very important, okay? Now, another thing is the discharge of contracts. This basically, if you wanna use, if you prefer to write more in layman's terms, discharge just means the termination, how you get rid of a contract, okay? Well, the first one is performance of a contract, all right? You can actually perform the terms, actually buy the house, that's performance. You can go through, complete what has been agreed to and fulfill your duty. Another one is gonna be assignment. You can actually assign your interest to another party. And we'll actually, if you come on and, and work with me and everything, uh, we'll actually do a training on assignment. Uh, and then also there's novation and there is breach of contract. Now, of course, the first three are the best ones, okay? Because the fact is, is it gets you out of liability. The last one is your worst one. It's where you don't fulfill your duty. Okay. That's where you go to law or to lawsuits. Okay. That's where lawsuits occur. So the performance of a contract, like I said, you complete the contract. An assignment is I assign my interest to another individual. I assign my interest to Stefan. So I was supposed to buy Mr. Eugene's property. I no longer want to purchase Mr. Eugene's property. And because of that, I end up, I assign my interest to Stefan and Stefan is now responsible to purchase the property, which releases me of liability, okay? There's also, like I said, novation. Novation, just like the word no at the beginning, means that there's no longer a contract, okay? The parties, decide that they're going to end up, they're going to back up, okay? They're gonna back out of the contract. They decide to, that it's no longer necessary. And the last one is, of course, like I said, your breach of contract. One of the parties does not fulfill their duties. If the party does not fulfill their duties, they are in breach. And because they are in breach, they can be sued, okay? And we'll talk about those in a little while. However, the key thing here is the statute of limitations. Understand if you're in breach of contract, there is a certain time period that you can bring a lawsuit against the party. Okay, there's a certain time frame in which you can end up bringing a lawsuit against that individual, and that is your statute of limitation. And we will spend time in that particular one when we get to it. Okay, because the information there is going to be very uh, useful. Uh, when we get to how we basically deal with breaches of contracts, okay? All right, so what are some other reasons for termination? How else can we terminate a contract other than having to go through breach of contracts and all this other stuff? What is another method? What other way can we get rid of this uh, breach of contract? Well, we can do what's called a partial performance. And a partial performance is basically what we're ending up doing is we're going to partly perform that particular contract. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to do a part job, for example. I, I come in, I do a certain amount of the work. And then after I complete that certain amount of work, I end up, I basically say, you know what? I no longer want to continue to do this job. So I end up, I am going to basically step back. Okay, and let basically my partial performance hopefully allow me to terminate the contract. But again, under the partial performance, I have to be able to have the other party that's going to agree with me being able to do that. Okay, the other option is substantial performance. Okay, substantial performance is where I'm going to end up doing a substantial amount of work in order to fully perform that contract, all right? I'm going to do a certain amount of work so that I am substantially done what I had to do so that I can end up having my, not full clarity, okay? But I've done most of the work. I've done probably 80, 90% of the job is what I've done. And if I've done 80, 90% of the job, I should be able to be, you know, basically be released of my liability 
because of the fact is, is that I've completed majority of the work, okay? Another one is gonna be the impossibility of performance, all right? The impossibility of performance is basically going to end up being, like I said earlier, I'm supposed to go in and I'm supposed to purchase a house, but that house has basically, guess what? It has now ended up, it's in a sinkhole. And if it's in a sinkhole, I can't purchase a house. So it's impossible for me to perform. Therefore, I would be released of my obligations. Another one, of course, is mutual agreement of the parties. The parties say, you know what? We want to we want to split everything. We want to take a break here. Well, in that situation, we want to break ways. They both agree to it. They can terminate the contract. There's also by the operation of law. If I'm purchasing a a property, say, let's go back to that one where Stefan is trying to buy Miss Linda's uh, property so that he can end up using it to grow marijuana, okay? And that situation is, is that if he ends up, it is illegal for him to do that, but then they change it where it's now legal, well, from an operation of law, he could be required to purchase it. But if it's the opposite effect where it was legal and then goes illegal, the operation of law would allow them to terminate the contract, okay? And the last one is rescission. Rescission is basically a way that we can rescind the contract so that we have a better understanding of how we're going to be putting things together. We're ending up rescinding it because we no longer wanna progress with the way that we were going, okay? So in this situation, I wanna take just a moment while I switch out my ear set for a second. Uh, so I'm gonna pause, if I can, the recording. So bear with me for just a second, please. Okay, so now that I've ended up, I was able to change that out and hopefully this will work a little bit better for everybody. Okay, so we went through basically those different, uh, basically different ways of terminating. Now, the next thing that we wanna look at when we're talking here in this situation, we wanna talk about contracts that are gonna be used within the business, okay? These are gonna be actually the forms that you're gonna use on a daily basis, okay? So in this particular situation, what we're gonna end up having is you're gonna have your listing agreements, okay? We're gonna start first with listing agreements and we'll jump to buyers in a minute. So the listing agreement, if you're kind of taking notes and everything here, the listing agreement is basically going to be between the uh, the broker and the seller, okay? The buyer agency agreement is going to be between the broker and the buyer, all right? So the first bullet, basically, if you're writing notes, and all the first bullet basically deals with listing or representation, okay? The right to represent. The next bullet is going to be your real estate sales contract. And this, of course, is going to be between the seller and the buyer, okay? The brokers are not involved in this. The options agreement is going to actually be by the buyer, if the buyer wants to exercise a right to option, period. The escrow agreement is going to be between the seller and the buyer. The leases, of course, are gonna be between the landlord and the tenant. The land contracts or contracts for deeds are gonna be the same as the real estate sales contract, which are gonna be the buyer and the seller. And the exchange agreement will also be in the same situation as the other one. So in this situation, understand that these are the different methods in regards to the contracts that we're gonna use in our industry, within our field, okay? Now, like I said, a listing agreement is basically an employment contract. Now, this is where when you get into real life, I'm gonna to try to throw some real life stuff in here for you. In real life, what would happen? Keith says, you know what, Mr. Nobles, I wanna come on with you at your firm. I wanna come work with you. And uh, what I would like you to do, Mr. Nobles, is I want to end up, I wanna be sponsored. I say, sure, Keith, come on in, man. Let's let me sign the paperwork. You come work for me. So Mr. Keith comes on, he gets sponsored by me. And I say, Mr. Keith, I want you to start building your book of business. I want you to get out there, I want you to build your book of business, I want you to meet clients, I want you to try to drum up your business. Okay. 
And in that situation, anybody that you get that wants you to represent them, I need you to get them if they are a seller, they're wanting to sell their property, I need you to get a listing agreement. Okay, I need you to get a listing agreement. So Keith goes out and talks to his family and his friends and his family says, you know what, I want to actually sell my house. Okay, so Mr. Keith goes, he walks along, he gets this guy, this gentleman to sell his house with him. And so Mr. Keith goes and he sits down, he gives this listing agreement. And again, like I said, the listing contracts between the broker and the, what? Miss, Miss Linda. The listing agreement between the broker and the seller, okay? The, the, list, the broker and the seller. However, Miss Linda, the person that Mr. Keith just met is in Dallas, Texas. And I am here in College Station. My question, Miss Linda, is can Mr. Keith sign this listing agreement on the broker's behalf? That's not my question. Can Mr. Keith sign my name on behalf on that contract? Okay, Mr. Keith, she says no. Do you agree or disagree? I agree with it. Oh, come on, y'all. Y'all messed up here. Uh, <laughs> she, she was with you. She was going down with you on that boat. But, uh, <laughs> but no, it actually is yes. Mr. Keith can sign on my behalf because he's okay. sponsored by me. Oh, yes. You see how that works, Keith? Yes, sir. Mr. Keith, and we haven't got to agencies, and that'll be discussed in agencies, but Mr. Keith, when he's sponsored by me, Mr. Keith is my basically agent. So he is basically able to sign on my behalf for these documents. That's why as a broker, you don't just sign anybody that you want. You sign people that you trust because the people that you bring on in this situation, you have to be able to trust them because they're gonna be signing contracts in your name when you go out and they are working and they're building their book of business. That's why they're a salesperson, a real estate agent, okay? So you will see on the forms that we'll talk about, there's a spot that says real estate associate or broker's associate, that is the real estate agent. The part that says broker is where the broker signs, but underneath there, there's broker associate. Does that make sense, Ms. Linda? Okay, Mr. Keith, is that good for you? Yes, sir. Perfect. So in that situation, like it says, the listing agreement is going to be an employment contract that employs or appoints a brokerage firm as the owner's special agent for the specific pur purpose of finding a buyer who is, and here's the key word here. I want to write this down or highlight it. Ready, willing, and able to buy according to the terms of the contract. Okay, y'all need to re y'all need to reinforce that. I'm gonna reinforce that for a minute. They always say three times in a row. You ready? Ready, willing, and able. Ready, willing, and able. Ready, willing, and able. Okay. When we do that, when we talk about ready, willing, and able, we're talking about in this situation. Mr. Keith, we're going to continue to, to proceed with his hypothetical. Mr. Keith has listed the property. And Mr. Keith has gone over. He's listed the property. He finds a ready, willing, and able buyer. Okay. Mr. Garrett, I'm going to come pick on you, so be ready. So Mr. Keith goes out. He finds a ready, willing, and able buyer named Mr. Grossman. And Mr. Grossman, in this situation, comes in, he wants to purchase the property, he, he's ready, willing, and able, he's ready to buy, he's willing to buy it, and he has the money to purchase it, okay? So in this situation, Mr. Grossman's gone in, he's ready to do all this, he's ready, willing, and able buyer, and guess what, Garrett? Mr. Stephan, Mr. Grossman, ends up bags out of the contract at the last minute, okay? He just bags out. My question, Mr. Garrett, is Mr. Key still owed a commission on that transaction? Yes or no? 
Uh, no, sir. Mr. Garrett says no. Mr. Keith, do you agree or disagree? Uh, I disagree. All right. Ms. Linda, do you agree or disagree? Okay, and Mr. Grossman. Agree. So I got I got a split here. <laughs> Mr. Eugene, can you hear me? Mr. Eugene, if you hit your space bar, it should unmute you. He may not be on, so that's fine. So the answer actually is, is Mr. Keith is entitled to a commission, okay? Mr. Keith is entitled to commission because, what did we just say up here? Mr. Keith bought a ready, willing, and able buyer. And because Mr. Grossman stepped out is not Mr. Keith's problem. The question right up here says, it's an employment contract that appoints a brokerage firm as its owner special agent for the specific purpose of finding a buyer who is ready, willing, and able to buy according to the terms of the contract. Mr. Keith met that whole definition by getting a ready, willing, and able buyer. So what's happened is Mr. Keith has checked off that box, that bullet right there, and he did his job. Because Mr. Grossman bagged out does not mean that Mr. Keith loses out on the contract. Mr. Keith did his job. So in that situation is Mr. Keith is entitled to his compensation, okay? Garrett, does that make sense for you? I want to make sure it's good. Yes, sir. It makes sense. Perfect, man. Perfect. All right. Now, this is something that y'all want to be very alert on is these up here. Okay. So these are the different types of listing agreements. There are going to be multiple types. The most important one, and I'm going to, I'm going to actually go over here. To this one I want to start with. Actually, I'm going to start with this one here, the open and non-exclusive. Okay. I love to start with this one and work my way backwards just because I want y'all to see the purpose here. So this open and non-exclusive listing is basically utilized only when a broker finds or procures the buyer gets paid. But here's the thing. The seller can sign multiple open agreements with more than one brokerage. And it's a unilateral agreement and the seller or the sell to the buyer automatically terminates all other open listings with or without notice. So Mr. Garrett, I'm gonna pick on you here. Mr. Garrett, he goes out and he says, you know what? I'm going to end up, I'm trying to get business, so I'm willing to sign open agreements, open listing agreements in this situation so I can get people to sell with me. The problem here with poor Mr. Garrett is Mr. Garrett has now created his client as his competition. So Miss Linda, he comes to you and he says, Miss Linda, I want to sell your property. I'm not going to do anything else. I just want to have an opportunity to put my sign in your yard, okay? And I'm going to end up, I'm going to put my sign in your yard and I'm going to go over and I'm going to try to sell it. But Miss Linda, you also yourself can go and sell the property. And here's something even better, Miss Linda. Mr. Grossman and Mr. Nobles, they are different brokers that's not even part of mine, they can also sell the property. So Mr. Grossman, Keller Williams, Mr. Nobles is Remax, and I'm with uh, Century 21, and he's gonna take it open once all of us are listing your property. But the only person that gets paid is the person that sells it. Mr. Garrett, you wanna sign a contract like that? No, sir. No, not at all. That's not a good contract. That's a terrible contract, okay? Because why would you go out and spend a ton of money, time, and effort if you really are competing against your own client? Okay? It's not worth it. Okay? And what actually happens in real life, I'll give you real, real life situations. What occurs is Miss Linda is going to let Mr. Garrett go show the property. And when somebody's extremely serious in purchasing the property, 
guess what Miss Linda's going to do? She's going to get their phone number, that client that's out there. And Miss Linda's going to call that client and backstab Garrett and take that listing for herself and not have to pay anybody. Okay? It happens. So you don't ever, ever want to take an open or a non-exclusive listing. Another one is what we call the exclusive agency. The exclusive agency in this situation is going to end up being a what we call a broker, uh, a brokerage who pays or gets paid if the property sells. Unless in this situation, we end up, we have a matter that ends up in this situation, they get paid if they actually sell, but if the owner finds the buyer, then guess what? Now we're in a situation where we are going to end up, we're going to have the buyer, okay, is going to be basically the one that gets paid. So what I mean, let me kind of rephrase that for a minute. What we're talking about here is this, is say, for example, an exclusive agency does this. I come over to Mr. Keith and I say, Mr. Keith, I work with Nobles Realty Group. I'm the broker. I'd like to sell your property, but I, w I understand that you may know people and you may want to sell your own property. I would like to sell your property, but if you happen to sell it or find a buyer before me, then I will not take a commission. Okay. The only difference here between this one that we just talked about, the exclusive or the uh, open listing versus this one that is the exclusive agency, the difference here is this situation, okay? Is that when you look here at this one here under the open non-exclusive, you have multiple brokerages that are competing for the sale as well as the seller. But when you go back here, to the exclusive agency. How many brokerages are involved in this, Ms. Linda? One. One. One broker. So in this situation is, it's still the seller can bring, get their own people, but what happens is, is in this situation, is that we end up, we only have one broker that can sell the property, okay? Now, the best and most important one is this very top one. It's called the exclusive right to sell. This is the most important one, okay? The exclusive right to sell is going to be where the brokerage gets paid if the property sells, regardless of who finds the buyer. We don't care who finds the buyer. Whoever finds them gets paid, okay? So if the seller finds the buyer, guess what? The broker still gets his money or her money. So this is the maximum protection to the brokerage. And the broker in this situation, of course, is going to give the maximum effort. Okay, because of the fact is they're getting paid. But on the bottom, the exclusive and the, o the open, they're not going to give as much. Because of the fact is why give if you're going to end up in this situation, you may not get paid. Okay, so... Again, those are your different types of listings. Now, in the listing agreements, however, there is in all three of these, so in the exclusive, the exclusive agency, and the open, there is what's called, oh, yes, Mr. Grossman. Uh, the exclusive right to sell is the one that's most used in Texas. The exclusive right to sell is going to be the majority used, okay? This one is going to be the most used. The exclusive right to sell most brokers won't even won't even let their agents even consider an exclusive agency or an open listing. Okay. Now there is one other one that's not listed on here. I'm going to take a moment because they do talk about this on the test, and you might want to write this down on a side note. It's called a net listing. N E T space listing. A net listing is this way. Now in Texas, it is not legal unless it is properly presented. And here's what a net listing is. Miss Linda wants to go over and she wants to sell her house. She looks on Z estimate. She gets on Zillow, looks at her Z estimate. And it says her house is worth $200,000. 
Now, all of you that are listening to me, if you believe the estimate, we need to have a long talk because the estimates are 100% incorrect, okay? They're, they are working on trying to get them correct, but they are incorrect, okay? Their formula is not correct at all. But the key thing in this situation is Ms. Linda gets on to Zillow. She looks at her Z estimate. She says, my goodness, my house is worth $200,000. I paid $100,000 15 years ago. I need to sell my house. So she calls Mr. Grossman over. She says, Mr. Grossman, can you come on over here and list my property? Mr. Grossman says, well, sure, Ms. Linda, I sure can. And while he goes over there, he tells Ms. Linda, well, how much do you want to list your property for, Ms. Linda? She says, well, I want to list it for $200,000. Mr. Grossman's like, oh, heck yeah, this, this is something I'm actually interested in buying for a rental. So he goes over and he looks on the CMA and does a comparative market analysis to see what the property's worth. And he finds out that that property's worth 100000 more. It's actually worth 300000 But Ms. Linda does not know that her property is worth 300 because she looks on Zillow. See, it says it's only 200. So Miss Linda goes over here and Miss Linda says, you know, I want to sell it. Well, Mr. Grossman does not disclose to Miss Linda that her property is worth 300,000. He wants to make a nice big commission off of this transaction. He wants to make $100,000. So what he does is he goes to Miss Linda and he says, Miss Linda, I'd like to do a net listing. I will list your property, and what I'll do is, if I get you two hundred thousand, I want you to agree that anything over two hundred thousand is my commission. And Miss Linda's like, "Oh my gosh, she's going to get me two hundred thousand!" And Zilla, "Oh man, that's a steal. He's not getting anything. How, that's such a sweet, kind young man." So yeah, Mr. Grossman, I would love to have you list my property. Okay. Because he's a sweet, kind young man, right, Miss Linda here. He's really nice. So Mr. Grossman signs the paperwork, and Mr. Grossman immediately goes out, and he goes and he sells the property to one of his investors for $300,000. Now, Mr. Grossman has a contract that shows that if he gets anything over two hundred, dollars he gets the rest. So when it goes to title, to close, Ms. Linda sits down and she sees that the property sold for $300,000 and Mr. Grossman's walking away with two hundred or 100000 and she's walking away with her 200000 Do you see an issue here, Mr. Keith? Yes, sir. <laughs> huh? Not good. Yeah, not yeah that's good. not good. <laughs> so just imagine, Mr. Keith, what if that was you? What if Mr. Grossman did that? Well, how mad would you be, sir? I would be really upset about that. Yeah, we would all be furious, okay? So in Texas, a net listing is illegal unless, here's the key thing, unless Mr. Grossman actually gave a comparative market analysis, which is called a CMA, if he actually gave Miss Linda a comparative market analysis and said, Miss Linda, your property is worth 300,000, do you still want to sell it for 200 and let me make a $100,000 profit? Can you change if yeah, of course you can change them. You can change whatever you want to negotiate. But the thing is, is Mr. Grossman has to give you has to give you the form showing that your property is worth $300,000, okay? If he does not do that, it is an illegal contract. Remember, does not have legal purpose. Therefore, it is a void contract and Miss Nobles can turn around and sue Mr. Grossman for deceptive trades. And because it is deceptive, if you remember from our lecture before, how many times Mr. Garrett can he sue for? He can sue for damages times what? Three times three. So Mr. Stefan would end up getting sued for $300,000 just because he wanted to make a $100,000 game. Okay, so very key that you know that one and they will test you on the test 
about net listings. I guarantee you, you will see it because people still today use them, okay? Now, moving along, the multiple listing clause, this is going to end up being in your spe special listing provisions, okay? The multiple listing clause states that basically it allows a broker to list the property in the multiple listing service. And I will be throughout class, you will hear me not saying multiple listing service. It's easier for me to say MLS, okay? That's just the terminology we use. So when I'm saying MLS, I'm talking about the multiple listing service. And what it is, is the MLS is just, everybody puts their houses into this. And we all the brokers that are part of the membership can see each other's listings, okay? And that's where you get that cooperation or what we call a co-op fee to the other broker, okay? So it is, if you join the MLS, you get the exclusive information of what's happening and what they're selling. And in exchange, you can get a fee, a percentage of the sale, which is your co-op fee. So while you may not be the listing agent, you could be the buyer's agent and represent a party, okay? Now, of course, the listing brokerage and the broker, of course, are going to represent the seller. And the buyer brokerage, or the broker that represents the buyer, is going to end up getting the other broker fee. Now, here's where it gets fun. I want you to take this and write this down. Here's the key point. I want you to put listing broker equals seller broker. So listing broker equals seller broker. And this is where it gets fun. So y'all get ready for this. Mr. Garrett, you ready for a second? I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you a question. Yes, sir. All right, I want you to write down Garrett, selling broker, S-E-L-L-I-N-G, selling broker equals what, Mr. Garrett? Listing broker? No, it equals the buyer. That's where I tricked you, and that's where they're going to trick you on the exam. We would think, wouldn't we, Garrett, that the selling broker would be the listing broker. I mean, what is it? <laughs> listing and selling, that's the same thing. But in reality, the selling broker is the buyer broker. And I know that sounds ridiculous ridiculous to some people and it does to me as well i promise you but it is basically the listing broker is going to represent the seller and the selling broker represents the buyer even though you would think it would be the seller it's actually the buyer okay now oh well here it is <laughs> what we just talked about there's your slide about the net listing again a net listing got we've already discussed uh, usually they put that before there, but I'll let y'all read through that. We've already explained it, but that primarily right there gives you your net listing. Basically, the brokerage receives a commission uh, as all money above a certain price, uh, illegal or not recommended, however, in most states. And as you can see right here at the bottom, that black bullet I was telling you, a Texas a broker may not take a net listing unless the principal, which is the seller, requires a net listing and the seller is familiar with the current values of the real estate, okay? As long as those two elements are met, you can take a net listing. But if they're not, you can't take it, okay? So I'm not gonna spend time on that. We just spent a little while on that already. All right, now, what do we do or how do we terminate listings? How do we terminate listings? This is extremely important. Well, to terminate a listing, we need to know that when the seller or when the agreement's purpose is fulfilled, such as like we talked earlier, a ready, willing, and able buyer has been found, then in that particular situation, we have a ready, willing, and able buyer, guess what? We have now fulfilled our duty. That agreement, that listing contract is done. Even if the buyer, Mr. Grossman, steps out for any reason, we've done our job, we're finished. Wipe my hands of it, okay? When the agreement's term expires, so in this situation, if the agreement expires, that's another thing that you need to be aware of, and this is just the sidebar here. 
Uh, we go over here and Mr. Keith, he wants to never lose a client. He wants to keep those clients forever with him. All right. And Mr. Keith, I promise you, I thought the same thing too. I was like, man, I need to get some contracts. When I first got started, I need to get some contracts out here. And as I get these contracts, I need to go over here and I need to end up, um, I need to go and try to keep them under a contract for the rest of their life. Okay. So they've got to always use me. The thing is, is that your contract has to have a set term, like a termination period. So when you fill out a contract, most of the time, most courts say that your listing contract can be no longer than approximately two to three years. You cannot put the word indefinitely in the listing termination, okay? It has to stay within a certain time, a reasonable time, okay? Some courts even consider reasonable only a year. Some consider two. It just depends on which court you're in. But again, it has to be an expiration date that's reasonable. If the property is destroyed or it is use is changed by some force outside of the owner's control, such as if the zoning has changed or there's been condemnation by infinite domain, we'll talk about those later, that is another way that a contract can end up being terminated. Okay. If title to the property is transferred by operation of law, if it's the case of the owner's bankruptcy or foreclosure, that can also end up causing a termination. If the broker and the seller mutually agree to cancel the listing, then in that situation, it's terminated. If either the broker or the seller dies or becomes incapacitated, if the salesperson dies, however, or becomes incapacitate, incapacitated, then the listing is still valid. What this is saying in this situation is, Mr. Keith, he is my sales agent, I'm the broker, and Mr. Keith has listing contracts, but Mr. Keith, God forbid, ends up, he's in a car accident, and he is put in the hospital, and he's incapacitated. He's in a coma, okay? In that situation, just because Mr. Keith is in a incapacitated row, the listings still are valid, even though he signed them, even though he signed them on his broker's behalf. But if it's the other way around, that the broker ends up, is in a car accident and becomes incapacitated, the listing ends up becoming, basically, it's done, it's, it's terminated, okay? That's why it's imperative that the broker is the one that ends up is basically uh, the main person. You want to make sure you always tell people, make certain the broker ends up is protected because if the broker ends up having something go wrong, everything in the business is done. Okay. So if the broker is incapacitated or dies in that situation, then the listings are terminated. Now let's talk about buyer agency agreements, okay? Buyer agency agreements are gonna be between, of course, the buyer and the broker, okay? And it is an employment contract that appoints a brokerage firm as a buyer's agent for the purpose of finding a suitable property. So this is the contract that allows me to go in as a broker to go and find people property. It also tells them that with this form, and this is extremely important, that without this form, anything, if I was to go show uh, Mr. Eugene a property, and I end up, I don't have a buyer's representation form, anything that Mr. Eugene shares with me, I have to, I have no option, I have to share that with the seller, okay, because Without a broker, a buyer representation agreement, anything that is shared with the broker must be shared with the seller. But if there is a buyer representation form, then the seller, seller's agent, the listing agent, would not have a right to the terms stipulated by the buyer's agent, okay? So it is imperative that if you're working with buyers that you get a buyer representation agreement and that buyer representation agreement puts protection around the buyer so that nothing ends up getting shared with anyone, okay? Now, when leasing property, <clears throat> leasing property deals with basically a lease 
is a contract between an owner of real estate, which is the leaseor, and a tenant, which is the leasee. Okay. A lease is going to be a conveyance, however, if you remember from the very first day we started lecture, they are conveying that one twig that is the possession. So in this situation, a lease is the conveyance of a possession of the real estate. It is also a contract to pay rent and to assume other obligations, okay? The statute of frauds, of course, is going to be the most states require the lease of more than one year to be in writing. All right. So if it is a contract for more than one year, it must be in writing. All right. And it's imperative that it has to be in writing. But if it is a lease for one year or less, it does not have to be in writing. Okay. A lease hold a state, and we'll talk about this as we get into principles and all of that, is basically it is the right of the tenant to possess real estate for the term of the lease. Okay, so as long as there is a lease agreement, then that tenant has what's called a lease hold estate. All right, if you end up or an owner of property or you're buying property, you have what's called a freehold estate because you have no holds on you, okay? But if you're renting a property that you own, so Ms. Linda, we say that you own a property and you're renting it, you own it free hold with a lease hold interest, okay? So you own the property, but there is a lease hold on that estate. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, how though are estates for leaseholds utilized? Well, an estate tenancy for years is one option, and that is basically for any definite period. So if there is a tenancy for years, there's gonna be a definite period that they have that property. If there's an estate from period to period, it's gonna be a periodic tenancy, and it is of course gonna be for an indefinite term, and guess what? It automatically renews, so it continues. An estate, or called an estate at will, or tenancy at will, is also gonna be an indefinite term. However, possession has to be with the landlord's consent. An estate or tenancy at suffrage is gonna be a tenant's previously lawful possession continued without the landlord's consent. So this last one, it's basically they are living in the property without the landlord's consent to being in the property. So they're basically squatting in some situations on the property, okay? Now, when we're talking about lease agreements, these are basically going to end up being requirements that are going to be required of a valid lease, okay? They have to have the capacity to contract, they must have legal, legal objectives. They also have to have an offer and acceptance and consideration as well, okay? These of course are going to be your four requirements of a valid lease agreement. If any one of those are missing, it's voided. Again, the same things versus valid that we talked about the four options, valid, void, voidable, and unenforceable also apply to these because it's a contract. So in that situation, what happens is, is you have these breakdowns of these different requirements. Now the possession and use of the premises, as well as the term of the lease and the security deposit are also going to be included within the lease agreement. Further, any improvements, accessibility, maintenance of the premises, destruction of premises, assignment and subleasing and options are also going to be included within the lease agreements as well, okay? So basically everything here and everything here is gonna be included within the lease agreements. That's why lease, lease agreements are oftentimes a lot longer than a contract for sale of a house. Sometimes they can be 30 pages, 40 pages, okay? Lease agreements are always a lot longer because there are a lot of rules and regulations. Okay, now in regards to the different types of rent, 
when we're talking about the different types of rent, we're going to be talking about gross, net, percentage, and variable. Now, gross, of course, is going to be a fixed rent, and the landlord pays all expenses. Okay, so most of the time, that is what you'll see majority of the time. The landlord pays all the expenses, and when the landlord pays all of the expenses, what ends up happening is, is the landlord uh, will continue to pay all of the expenses, uh, but what ends up happening is the tenant is oftentimes going to pay more than the other ones, okay, because of the fact is, is the landlord is paying the taxes, the utilities, and everything else. A net lease is going to be basically where the tenant will pay the base rent, however, they pay some expenses. So they may pay taxes, they may pay insurance, or they may pay maintenance, okay? So they'll pay a base set amount, and then they pay taxes, insurance, and other things on top of the ownership of the, of the deal. So they're paying that maybe, a, say, a $1,500 flat fee, but they have to pay at the end of the year the taxes on the property, okay? A percentage lease is gonna be rent is based on a percentage of the gross income and sales. This is a lot of times you will see, uh, they end up, they come in and they say, all right, uh, Miss Linda, you're wanting to rent this property. We understand, Miss Linda, that you end up, that you are a new business, so you have very little income. So your income is based off of your sales or your income that you make off of your services. So what happens, Miss Linda, in this situation is that we're going to go over here and we're going to let you only pay $1,000 a month for a 2,000 square foot property. However, we want each month, we want 20% of your sales. So if Miss Linda makes no sales for the first three months, she would pay her flat $1,000. But if Miss Linda on the fourth month, Miss Linda ends up selling $100,000, she would have to pay $20,000 for that month because they get 20% of her rent or of her income, I'm sorry. So again, that's a percentage and it's oftentimes utilized for new businesses. Then of course there's variable. And this is where rent will increase or decrease at predetermined intervals. Okay, so that kind of, we end up, we start you at one rate, after a certain period, we increase, then we increase, then we increase, and it keeps going up. Okay, so in that particular situation, it gives you the breakdown in regards to the variable increases as they end up going forward. There is also what we call the ground rent, or ground lease, and it's where you're renting basically unimproved. This is for people that want to do uh, deer leases or they want to end up running cattle on property. That's a ground lease, okay? You're running your, your cattle on there. There's another one called sandwich uh, lease. This is where the original lease between the landlord and tenant one, but after tenant one has sublet to tenant two, okay? So in that situation, you have tenant one, tenant one now subleases it, However, you still have the landlord, they're all together, they're basically in a sandwich lease, okay? When we talk about oil and gas, oil and gas is basically where the land landowner allows for the exploration and production of oil and gas on the landowner's property. However, in return, they do end up getting payment for that property, for the usage. When we are trying to discharge leases, we do this when we are in the contract, it's gonna terminate. So if the contract actually terminates by time, say time just goes on, it terminates, it discharges. If, the, if there's an agreement, of course, by the parties, or if there's an operation by law, if a person files bankruptcy or whatever, that can end up discharging the lease. When dealing with an options contract, an options contract is basically going to be the potential buyer will purchase the right to buy at a fixed price for a designated period of time, okay? So they end up, most of the time you'll see this is when a person is buying a uh, property, okay? They're ending up purchasing a property. And as they're purchasing property, what they end up doing in this situation is they've gone through, they've purchased the property and they ended up 
they have now gone over and they have decided that, okay, I want to put a contract in, but what I want to end up doing here is I want to make certain that I have done my investigation. I have done my part to make certain that I have basically got the right property. So as an example here, Miss Linda, well, let's pick on Mr. Eugene here. Mr. Eugene here, he's yeah. purchasing a property. Yes. And Mr. Eugene has gone over. He's uh, decided he's putting an offer on a property, mm -hmm. but he wants to make certain, okay, wants to make certain here that in this particular situation that the property he's buying is actually a good property. Okay, we want to make certain that this property is a good property. Now, Mr. Eugene is represented by Mr. Keith. Okay, Mr. Keith is a real estate agent and he has put the contract in. So let's play this out. We're going to have a hypothetical real quick. Mr. Keith represents Mr. Eugene. Miss Linda, you're the seller. So Mr. Eugene, you're the buyer. Miss Linda, you're the seller. Keith, you represent the buyer. And Mr. Garrett, you represent the seller. Okay, so here we go. We got a little little hypothetical we're going to do. Now, Mr. Keith, you have submitted a contract to Mr. Garrett. Mr. Garrett has presented the contract to Miss Linda. But Mr. Eugene, Mr. Keith, has asked you, he said, Mr. Keith, I am concerned that there may be some foundation issues and all. When should you end up doing the inspection? Should you do it after the contract is signed? Or do you do it before the contract is signed? What do you think, Mr. Keith? Before the contract is signed. All right, I have a before. I have a before, I have a before for you, Mr. Eugene. Yeah. All right, he says yeah. All right, Mr. Garrett and Miss Linda, do you agree with those terms? They both said that they agree that it's before. Do you agree, Miss Linda? Miss Linda says no. Mr. Garrett, do you agree with Miss Linda or do you agree with Mr. Keith? And Mr. I agree with Miss Linda. You agree with Miss Linda. Okay. The correct answer is yes. You do it after the contract signs. And that's what it establishes the option period. Okay. And I guess to kind of make it a little bit more clear, let me pull it up over here if I can. Give me just a minute. You see right here real quick on your screen, Let's go over to those contracts. Go to contract here. Let's go right here. Right here. Pull it up here and let y'all see. You scroll all the way down. Here we go. Scroll. Let me find it here. Right here. If you look at 23, and we'll actually go through this when we get there. But if you look at number 23, this creates an option, okay? And it says, for a nominal consideration, the receipt of which is hereby acknowledged by the seller and the buyer's agreement to pay seller whatever amount, which is your option fee, within three days after the effective date of this contract, seller grants the buyer the unrestricted right to terminate this contract by giving notice of termination to the seller within blank days after the effective date of this contract, okay? What this primarily does is this has created, this provision right here, paragraph 23, creates an option for Mr. Eugene and for, well, Keith, you would be representing him, but it would be for you, Mr. Keith, to help Mr. Eugene get inspections scheduled but it's after the contract has been fully completed, okay? So what happens here is, Mr. Keith, you've gone in, you have got it all signed, everything's receipted, the contract's good to go. Now you have a certain time period to do inspections on the property. So it would be after in this particular situation that you would end up, that you would have inspections done, okay? Does that kind of make that clear for you, Mr. Eugene and Mr. Keith? Yeah, that does. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. So in that situation, what happens here is this paragraph, Mr. Eugene would be paying $100. Most of the time what we fill in here is we put in, so that y'all can see what I'm doing, I'll use my mouse here. We put in this first blank here, $100. 
And for the second blank, it can be between seven or 10 days, depending upon what they agree to, okay? So most of the time it'd be $100 for about seven to 10 days. Yes, Miss Linda. Okay, on there. The, the seven Let me come over real close so that they can hear you. I'm gonna okay. come over by you. Say for it. The seven, like for instance, within let's say ten days, okay. put in there. Is that when the ten days is when they sign the contract, or is it what? When does it go into effect? Yes. Okay. So if you look back up here, actually, Mr. Keith, you you and Miss Linda have been working together. What do you think the answer is, Mr. Keith? Y'all been work, doing pretty good. What do you think? When does this go into effect? Uh, I would think it would go into effect uh, whenever we signed the contract and made the deal. Uh, so he's right there. So you're you're right. What it would do, he's, he's on, on point there. What it is, is let me find it real quick. Here it is right here. This box right here. So like Mr. Keith said, if... Miss Linda, you signed, and Mr. Eugene signed here. Whatever date's put here, the next day, if you look up here, the next day, basically, let me see if I can't find the term again. Let me find it here. Got to find it here. Right here. The seller within blank days after the effective date. And this is your effective date right here. So right here, within whatever this blank is, and it's the after, so it means the day after is when it would start. So if you were to sign tonight this contract, when does your contract start, Miss Linda? When does this? That's correct. If it's signed tonight and the effective date's the 16th, day one starts on the 17th. Do you agree with her, her Miss, Mr. Keith? Yeah, I agree with her. There you go. So that is exactly right there. So in that situation, it starts that next day, okay? Uh, Mr. Eugene, do you understand that? Yes. Okay, and Mr. Garrett, do you understand that? Yes, sir. Perfect. I don't know, Darren or Mr. Jacob, if y'all can hear me or not. Uh, do y'all understand? Okay, that's fine. I know some people are using different tablets and all. Oh, there's Mr. Jacob. You, do you Are you good, Mr. Jacob? Yes. Perfect. Excellent. All right. So in this situation is we end up, you want to see those breakage. So it starts the day after. So really, when you're going through this contract, and of course, we're going to go through this in detail in the next class. So what we just ended up doing now is we're just talking the law. But we're going to in the next class, in the next two weeks, we're going to actually go through this form in detail. And we're going to talk about it. Okay. And we're going to explain it in more detail to y'all. But again, ultimately in this situation is we're going to always look at the effective date is this date that's right here in this box. This date is ultimately going to be how everything starts, but it's the day after. So whatever date goes in here, the day after is when it starts. Okay. So when you're reading your contract, you want to immediately, the first thing you should start on, the very, very first thing is jump straight to this box, see what date's in here and then go back and look at my dates and my contract, okay? So if it's like Christmas, like Christmas is coming up right around the corner here, guess what? I know a lot of people are gonna be closed next week. Some of them are gonna be closed two weeks. So if they're gonna be closed two weeks, an inspector, let's say my normal inspector is out of town for two weeks, then I need to make certain that up here in my termination that I have given myself enough time to get an inspection done, okay? I've had issues before guys and gals, where myself, I put 12 days in there, 14 days, and they would not budge with me and only gave me five or seven days. Before I have my client sign anything, I need to make certain that I can get my inspectors out there because if I sign this, I'm stuck to it, okay? I'm, I'm bound to those terms. So there is no flexibility. <laughs> it's basically you got to do it, okay? All right. So with that being said, let's jump back. Let me go back here, here we go. So again, the option is basically the potential buyer purchases the right to buy a fixed price for a designated period of time. The purpose of course is I promise to sell if you prompt or decide to buy. That is a purpose, okay? 
A unilateral is the binding on a seller while the buyer has the option or the choice to perform their inspections or whatever performance that they need to complete. Now, of course, it will become bilateral when it's actually going to be exercised by the optionee. Okay. And one thing I want y'all to understand while I've got the moment here and I've got the time, you're going to see a lot through this lecture. You're going to see this right here. Let me see if I can can't get a pointer. This right here. You see this part where we're talking about OE or I mean EE? Okay. I want you to write down on your on your book or your notes or wherever you're writing stuff. I want you to write OR, line underneath, and I want you to put EE. Okay. Then after you put OR, next to OR, I want you to put equal sign. And I want you to put doing. I want you to put equal sign next to EE, and I want you to put receiving. Okay. So when we're talking about these things, when we talk about sellor and sellee, what is the sellor? The sellor, I said OR means what, uh, Garrett? Can you say that again? Yes, sir. In that situation, so the sellor is what? What is that person? Who would be that person? The sellor. The person selling the house? That's correct. It's the seller. Now you'll say, wait a minute, you just said sell or, and you said seller. That's right, because remember, the person selling the house, doing the selling, that's the seller. So if I ask you now, Garrett, who's the sellee? Who would that be? Who's receiving the house, Garrett? Oh, the sellee. Right, but who would that be? Starts with the B. The person, the buyer. There you go. You're getting it. So in that situation, and don't feel bad, Garrett. I'm, I'm, I'm picking on you here, but I'm, I'm going to do that with everybody. Here's another one, Mr. Eugene. Yep. Okay. Who is the mortgageor? Now there's only there's in this situation it's normally seller and buyer, but in this situation it's a little different. Who's the mortgageor? Who's the one doing? the mortgage. And don't let it trick you from what we're talking about. Don't use common sense on this one. It's going to be the opposite. Who's the one doing the mortgage? That would be the receiver. Okay, who's the receiver? Uh, Starts buyer? with a B. It's a who? Buyer. buyer? The buyer. So who's the mortgagee? Seller? No. Where are they getting their money from? The bank. There you go. The mortgagee, the, the, the buyer, it's received, the, they've got the loan, okay? But they're the ones that are actually paying, making the payment. So they're doing the payment. They're paying it. That's their action. They're doing something. Who's receiving the benefit? The lender, the bank. Do you see how these are going to be? So when you take your test and you see like option or and option E, Think about that. So let me say this test. I'm going to test Miss Linda here. Miss Linda, who is the optioner? Who's the optioner? No. The buyer. The buyer remembers the one that's doing. Remember, Keith is over here helping Eugene get an inspection. Mr. Eugene is doing what? The inspection. So he is the optioner. Who's the one that's receiving the benefit of the option? You just said it, the seller. The seller's getting the money doing nothing, okay? That's your difference here. That is your difference between a option or and an option E. These, of course, are going to end up being confusing. There's nothing wrong with this. We're gonna spend an entire semester going through these. You're gonna get it by the end of it. Of course, the first time you're not going to get it because it's confusing. Okay, I understand that. But you need to kind of just keep that note in the back of your head that, okay, OR means doing, EE is receiving. That's kind of what you need to think through them as we go through these. So as you see these words pop up on the screen, it should snap. It should start snapping. Okay. So in this situation, what's happening in this one is 
they're actually saying that the owner is in this one going to be the optioner and the buyer is going to be the optionee. Now I'll tell you why they're talking. It's a little bit different from this one over here. The difference between this one, however, is this situation. They are looking at it from the situation of the one that is actually exercising their right. Okay, so this is where we get back to that confusion process, like I told you earlier, where the terms are going to be confusing. Okay, you have to look at how it's being exercised, how it is being utilized. Previously, we had a different stance. This stance, what they're talking about is the exercising of the option. Okay, this one was the actual doing, the exercising of the option. This one is the one in regards to the actual getting through and giving the rights away. So again, we will talk about those and y'all have practice tests and all. Don't freak out on me because most students freak out after this, but this is another way of dealing with this. Okay, don't freak out. We're going to get through this. Another one, typically it is going to include a non-refundable option fee. And if the buyer decides not to buy, then the seller has no recourse, but they do keep to, uh, get to keep their option fee, okay? The purchase price is going to be paid in all installments to the seller, and the seller will deliver a deed when the final payment is made. Now, I'd like to spend a little minute, a bit of time on this one. And for those of you that are ready, this is our last slide. So everybody can relax, okay? It's our last one. But I want to spend a moment on this one before we call it a class this evening. A land contract is different than a normal everyday sale. They use the word land contract, but where you often see this is, is the for sale by owner. Okay, this is a for sale by owner. What happens in this particular situation is a for sale by owner ends up, they're wanting to utilize installments. You see here, installment payments to the seller, their seller financing. Now, the thing about seller financing is that seller financing, it's they're acting like the bank. It can be good if you know what you're doing. It can be very detrimental if you don't know what you're doing. Okay, here's the problem. Most contracts that are land contracts or for sale by owners that are seller financing are going to be written in whose favor? Mr. Keith. Could you repeat that one more time? I had, sure. had a little static. Sure. In this situation, who exactly with this land contract, who are they benefiting? Do they benefit the seller or do they benefit the buyer if it's a seller financing contract that's going to benefit the seller exactly the seller is going to write that contract in their favor so that they end up they get the most benefits out of it so here's what we're going to do mr jacob being the nice guy that he is wants to end up helping mr garrett and Mr. Garrett is a single dad with a child. He has terrible credit. He can't get a loan. And Mr. Jacob wants to be a nice person and help him out. He wants to be friendly, okay, to help Mr. Garrett have a place for his child. And he tells Mr. Garrett, he says, Mr. Garrett, uh, I will sell or finance a property to you. I want to help you out, sir. And I will, I will sell or finance this property to you, sir. But here's the thing you're going to end up having to sign a land contract and you're going to make installment payments to me. Now, of course, Mr. Jacob is a businessman. He's going to charge higher interest because he's taking on a bigger risk. That's normal. Okay. But in the contract, Mr. Garrett, Mr. Jacob tells you that you must hand deliver your payment, monthly payment to him every single month on the first of each month and you have a two day grace period. So if he does not get the payment in say check in a form of a check in hand payment within the third day, you have breached the contract and the contract ends up everything that you've paid and the pro possession of the property reverts back to him. Okay. Now, Mr. Garrett in this situation 
he needs a house. He needs a place to stay. And he'd rather pay to buy a house than to rent. Okay. So Mr. Garrett and all goes along. He does his payments. Say it's a 30-year payment. He's paying Mr. Jacob every time, on time. Everything's going perfect. However, at the very, very end, he's got his last payment. And Mr. Jacob ends up he finds out from a friend that technically, if Mr. Garrett does not pay his last payment pursuant to the terms of the contract, that Mr. Jacob could end up getting the entire property back and ending up could resell it and do it all over again. So Mr. Jacob thinks, hmm, I'm actually not going to end up and be at my property for three days. And he's just happened to be the three days that I end up is when Garrett's supposed to pay me. So Mr. Garrett gets ready to go over to pay as normal. And he tries to find Mr. Jacob and he can't find Mr. Jacob to pay him. So Mr. Garrett says, okay, no worries. Mr. Jacob is a very good guy. He would never do such a thing. I'll pay him on the fourth day when he comes back. Mr. Jacob goes over and he comes back on the fourth day. Garrett's there. He hands him his money and Mr. Jacob hands him an eviction notice. He says, well, what, what did I do? And Mr. Jacob says, you did not pay me pursuant to the terms of the contract. You have breached the contract. Mr. Garrett, you need to pack up all your stuff and you need to get out of my house and go. Mr. Garrett, can Mr. Jacob do that to you? If it was in the contract that I had to, then yes. That is correct. Mr. Jacob can do that. Now, not, now, of course, Mr. Jacob is not that type of person. I'm just using it as an example. But there are people that are out there that are landlords like that that will purposely set contracts in terms that basically they will get payment and they set up the last payment in a way that they do not get paid as pursuant to the terms of the contract and the party is in breach of contract and that person now is evicted and loses all their money and the seller gets back the property, okay? Now, that is, again, we're talking utopia world here in class, because that's what we do. But in real life, of course, Mr. Garrett would have sued and Mr. Garrett would have tried to you know, argue his stance and Mr. Jacob would argue his stance and all, but in pursuant to utopia world, which was how we teach for classrooms and for tests, we talk about utopia world, this technically by law under the terms of this, this education, how the testing goes, Mr. Jacob could go in and Mr. Jacob could tell Mr. Garrett, you need to leave because you have breached the terms of the contract. Okay, so it is always imperative that when you're dealing with a client and a client says, I want to purchase property and they tell you that they're doing seller financing, it is your duty to advise them to seek legal representation. You never, as a real estate agent, advise them on this, but you tell them that they need to seek legal representation so that their rights are being taken care of and they're not being taken advantage of, okay? Very key in that situation. And I always bring that up because I always have a lot of students that will ask those questions or they'll have family or friends that are doing uh, seller financing or, or something to that nature. It always needs to have legal counsel to review those files to make certain that we are covering all of our bases, okay? All right, so this evening we have completed chapter three. I know it was a lot of material. I know that was a ton of information and you probably will need to re-listen to this lecture again. Please make certain, all I'm asking is that you are please completing your discussion post, that you are also as well completing your quizzes. I will be reviewing them at the end of this week. We'll get through our five chapters, that's halfway through. I will review our chapters and everything, see where everything's at. Uh, I will be contacting those of you that do not complete your tasks. If you're not completing them, I will be sending an email, just a friendly reminder. 
uh, those all have to be completed before you're eligible to sit for the final exam. The final exam, we will be discussing how the final exam will be. Uh, it will be proctored. We do have to proctor the exam. Most likely, we will do a Zoom session. Everybody will take your final at the comfort of your home, uh, but we will do a Zoom proctoring session and you will be taking your final examination uh, through Zoom. Okay, so we'll work all of those terms out as we get to it. Uh, and again, you must take and get at least a 70% on your final exam to pass the course to move on to the next course. Okay, other than that, we're going to go ahead and call this a lecture, call this a night, and we will pick up tomorrow, everybody. So I will see everyone tomorrow evening. Y'all have a good evening and a good night and stay safe. Good night, everyone.